Okay. All right, well, now we're on. All right, so uh, I decided I'd come on a little bit early, uh, make sure that our camera and our sound are working. And I'm hoping that everybody is gonna get in soon. We have 80 people interested this week in learning how to make crepes. And um, just off the top of my head, if you're not a fan of foul language, this may not be the demo for you <laughs> because I cursed a lot doing the recipe trial to make sure I liked the flavor, the consistency, and the technique of making this particular recipe of crepes. So um, I'm hoping that I don't F-bomb you too much and curse like a sailor, but it was, I was having some challenges. So you may have some challenges and it's okay. You just have to laugh about it. I curse a lot doing Okay. Okay. <clears throat> I have my Yankee shirt on today. I wore my Golden Knights shirt last week because <clears throat> I grew up in New York and uh, if things were not in quarantine lockdown right now, we would be watching baseball this afternoon. I'm sure the Yankees playing somebody. Um, this is my all time favorite player, but he is retired and in the Hall of Fame. And my new favorite player is Aaron Judge. So if anybody on the Yankees is watching, I will cook with any of you anytime. I'm looking at you, Aaron Judge. And Stephanie Weiss joined it. Oh, good. Um, so uh, last week, my hair was getting on my last damn nerve and on my mother's last damn nerve. So it's pulled back, and I hate wearing it like this because it gives me a headache. So as soon as we're done cooking, it's coming out because it gives me a headache. So um, we're going to wait a few minutes for everybody to get chimed in. Uh, if you are already in and you have a question, fire it away. Um, this is what we're doing today is making a basic crepe recipe. And then we're going to do two different fillings to go in it. One is sweet with fruit and chocolate, which is never a bad idea. And the other one is savory with a Florentine filling. Uh, you could choose shrimp or chicken, whatever you have on hand. I happen to have shrimp frozen in the freezer, so I poached them this morning, and that's what I'm gonna be working with. But shredded chicken off a of rotisserie chicken works really well. If you've got leftover roast chicken that you made or leftover chicken breasts, just kind of shred it up with a couple of forks or with your hands, and that'll go in fine. Um, it doesn't need to be warmed up because the filling is going to warm it up. So I'm going to get my shrimp out of the freezer, or out of the refrigerator. I'm also going to get out my spinach, the Florentine portion, and the onion, and these beautiful, beautiful garnishes that we got from Desert Bloom Organic Produce. I don't know if you can see these, but they are absolutely beautiful edible flowers from Desert Bloom. Um, it's a co-op, you buy in, and um, it's local here in Las Vegas. So if you live here in Las Vegas and you wanna get fresh produce delivered to your door, um, right now we are in the middle of a share and you will be able to join Desert Bloom later on. Um, but definitely look into it because you don't get any fresher than this. I mean, seriously, this was picked Monday and delivered to me on Tuesday. So we're gonna actually garnish our sweet crepe with some of these edible flowers as opposed to the whipped cream because I forgot to buy heavy cream. So we're just gonna set those off to the side. Uh, we're looking at 9.03 right now. How many people do we have in, babe? Uh, 19. 19, okay. So uh, the other thing that I'm gonna do, which I don't expect you to do, is I'm actually going to show you what Crepe Suzette looks like, and that involves flambéing, and I wanted Nancy to do it with me, and she put her foot down, she said, absolutely not, I will set the house on fire. So I will show you how to she do would. it. and <laughs> show you the safe way to do it. 
Oh, babe, could you reach in that drawer and pull me out the clicker? I forgot to get my clicker. And yeah, if she, thank you. If she didn't, Walt would. <laughs> nah, not Walt. Okay. So the only special piece of equipment, other than your stove and your cookware, that you're going to need today is a blender or a hand blender. Because the key to creating the crepe batter is to make sure it is perfectly smooth. So we're gonna jump right on that first because after we mix it up, we're gonna want it to rest for a little bit. I forgot to get the milk out of the refrigerator. <laughs> it's out front. <laughs> I'm gonna tap dance for a few minutes. Um, John is running out to our front refrigerator to get me um, the milk that I left out there. We actually have multiple refrigerators, I know. We have three, one is completely filled with beer, um, one is filled with all the gorgeous fresh produce and the milk that I hardly ever use, so I don't wanna keep it in here, and this one is reserved for what is being eaten in the next couple of days. So, I, no, I'll measure it out, but I just set it on the counter, it's fine. Okay, so we're gonna start off with four eggs, and I like to crack each egg into a bowl. And I mentioned this last week for a couple of reasons. First of all, I want to make sure I don't get any shell in it. And if you do it into a prep bowl first, before you move it into your mixing bowl, it's a lot easier to get shell out of one egg than swim around and try to get it out of four eggs, you know? And then the other reason is, you know, sometimes you get an egg and it's a little funky or it looks weird or, it, you know, you're just not happy with it. And that way you're not putting that right into your recipe and going crap. Now I've just ruined the whole recipe. So I like to do mine uh, separately and then add them in. It's just a little, I don't know. I don't know if you want to call it a pro tip or if you want to call it... Um, a quirk, but that's how I, that's how I work. All right, so we're going to need the four eggs that I told you about, one and one-thirds cup of milk, and we are going to first start out by mixing these together. Get your whisk. You, want, you don't need to incorporate a lot of air in this because um, you want them to be flat. It's not like we're making an omelet where we want them to be really fluffy. These are going to end up being really flat. So don't worry about incorporating air into it. You just want to break it up so it looks like scrambled eggs. Okay? And then we're going to add in our milk slowly. set this aside because I'm going to need it later. And then we're going to do a half a teaspoon of salt. Now, if you were, if you wanted to make a sweeter crepe, you could actually add in a couple of teaspoons, a couple of tablespoons of sugar. Um, like if you were going to do an all dessert thing, but we wanted a really neutral one because we're going to use it for two purposes. And we're going to melt some butter. Because that's going to be the final ingredient after we take it out of the blender. And you're going to do two tablespoons, which is one ounce of butter. I just use the markings on the butter stick and cut straight through. And depending on how strong your microwave is and how cold your butter is, it's going to depend on how long you have to work with it. So just a reminder, this is a, can, I know, Ken only wants to be the star of the show. Uh, just a reminder, this is a, my real kitchen. This is a real house. There are real dogs who may or may not bark at any time. And I'm anticipating you guys hearing barking today because I just got notification that some of my things that I ordered online are coming today. So with my luck, they will come while I'm cooking for you. And we're gonna get our flour ready.
and we're going to set our butter aside just to cool a little bit. All right, so I actually printed out the list that I made for you guys um, so that I didn't forget anything like I did last week. I told you guys to have bay leaf and some stuff on hand that I just totally forgot to use. So I actually printed out the recipe. So you're going to add your flour gradually. Stir, stir, stir. It doesn't have to be perfectly smooth because that's why we're going to stick it in a blender. But you don't want any great big clumps. When you get done making this, it should look like a really thin, anemic pancake batter. And that is exactly the texture you're looking for. So if you're thinking, oh crap, this, this looks too watery, don't, it's fine. So one of the things that we're gonna do, one of the reasons we started with the batter is because once this goes through the blender, there's gonna be some bubbles in it and we wanna make sure those bubbles have a chance to rust out and go away. And the other reason is letting the flour sit in the liquid helps the flour absorb the moisture and become smoother and become a better texture when it's cooking. If you just throw this right into the pan, it's not gonna give you the crepe-like texture that you're looking for. Okay, so I think I have all my ingredients in there. Let me just quick look. Flour, salt, eggs, milk, and our melted butter is gonna go in after it comes out of the blender. Okay. So using your blender or your hand blender for 20 to 30 seconds, depending on the power of your equipment, um, you're just going to pour it on in and scrape out your bowl really well so that you get all of the lumps out of there because you're going to strain your uh, crepe batter right back into this bowl. And it, the whole point of doing this is to get rid of the lumps. You're going to hear some noise. Now, I have a blend tack blender, and it actually has a setting on it for batter. And so I'm just going to hit that and let it do its thing. that I told you to have. If you don't have one, it's fine. You may just find a lump or two in your batter. Um, but what the sieve is going to do is it's going to hopefully uh, strain out any, um, you know, the majority of the bubbles that we don't want. And it's also going to strain out any residual lumps. So you can see on my, how it took some of the bubbles out. Oh God, the dog's gonna have to feel really bad. Okay. All right, so now we're just gonna cover that and let it sit. We're just gonna let it rest and we're gonna make our fillings. Okay. So let's start on our strawberries. Because what we're gonna do, we're gonna learn a technique today called macerating. Now, not masturbating, not macarena, not marinating, you're gonna macerate. Oh, I forgot to put the butter in. God, see, even I screw up. I'm not perfect. Take your melted butter and pour that in. Sorry, guys. And just whisk it in. I want all of that butter. Because everything's better with butter. <laughs> okay. 
I knew I had that whisk set aside for a reason. Okay. Now I'll cover it and set it aside. All right. So maceration is a way of getting the most out of your berries. Making sure that there's a lot of juice, making sure that you've got um, really good flavor from them. So we're going to start, I already washed my berries, so a couple of tips about working with strawberries. Do not cut them and then wash them because berries become gigantic sponges and will soak up all of the water, okay? Now, when you're looking for berries in a grocery store, you should look for ones that are like this. See how there's no white at the top? Every now and then you're gonna find them mixed in the, the, the court, the container. But try to choose ones that are green. This is nice bright green and that the red goes all the way to the top. That's how you know it's a perfectly and fully ripe berry. So I'm actually using a berry huller to take out the center. And I'm gonna pull this aside just so I have a place to put them. Um, with this one, because it is um, got a little bit of white at the top, I'm just gonna cut it off. Not gonna waste that berry. And then I'm just gonna get that hull out. You wanna take the hull out for the fact that it's really not tasty. It's kind of rough tasting and it's um, kind of fibrous. So just pull your berries, get your holes out. I know Alton Brown would say that this is a unitasker, but it's really not because it's a melon baller on the other end. I also use this to scrape the seeds out of cucumbers. Um, if I'm going to do zucchini boats to fill with stuff, I scrape out the middle with this. Now you do as many strawberries as you think you're going to need, okay? Since it's just John and I, I'm just going to do a few. So here's why I said the egg slicer was optional. If you have an egg slicer, you could take your berry, stick it in point side up, and it will slice your berry into completely even pieces, okay? If you do not have... I did not get that because you... Oh, it'll, it'll cut the berries up into even slices. Okay, and I like consistency. Um, you can't always get it, but if you, if you have an egg slicer, this is what you're using it for. If you don't have an egg slicer, take your berries and just cut them into quarters. And that will be fine too. Okay? I am like, just like that, just quarters. If it's a really big berry, you might want to go a little bit smaller because um, you don't want great big honking pieces in your mouth. So I'm just going to slice these up real quickly. Another thing that this um, egg slicer is great for is slicing mushrooms. When um, my son was really small, he called it the magic mushroom slicer. And he was talking to another adult. And the adult thought that the mushrooms were magic and not the slicer. <laughs> and this is a great way to get kids in the kitchen too. Because this is a safe tool for them to use. So they can participate in helping cook. I think that's going to be plenty for John and I, and I mean, that looks really nice. And you see how gorgeous the color of the berries is? That's because they're ripe all the way through. We're also going to add, because my husband loves them, we're going to add some blueberries, just a few. And again, I rinsed these off already. And um, if, like I said in the, in the instructions, if you had um, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, any combination of those, it works really well. So now here's where the fun comes in. We're going to take, I, we don't like our super sweet. So we're going to use just a tablespoon of sugar. If you like things to be a little sweeter, add a little bit more. Just sprinkle your sugar on the top. And I'm going to add, and I recommend that you do, a pinch of salt. Now this particular salt is a vanilla fleur de sel, which is... A fancy French term for flowery salt. 
Now, with this quantity, you need that much. When I say pinch, I mean pinch. And the fact that this has the vanilla in it, it's going to add an extra level of flavor, an extra step on our flavor ladder. Now, Nancy asked me to talk about my salt because she uses regular table salt, and that's fine, but I don't. I use um, kosher salt when you cook, and in my opinion, that should pretty much be the only salt that you use. While we're talking about salt, you're going to stir your base. Now, I'm not talking stir. You want to fold, which means start away from you. I don't know. Can you see it, John? Start away from you and pull it toward you and just flip it over. Because we are not trying to break the berries up. We're just trying to coat them in our sugar. Okay? And now we're going to add the grand marnier. So this is optional. Um, if you're making these for kids because this is not going to be cooked, skip it. If you don't drink, skip it. I happen to like just a little bit in there. You know, just a smidge. Now, I said, see, that's all I'm putting in. Just a teaspoon. Um, you could put in as much as you like. But what it's going to do is the sugar, the salt, and the alcohol are going to help draw the juices out of the berries and make our sauce for us. Okay? So let's go back to the salt. In my opinion, the only salt you should be cooking with is kosher salt. Kosher salt has nothing else in it except sodium and chlorine bound together to make a molecule. That's it. That's all it's in it. When you get table salt, sometimes there's additives like silica dioxide that stop it from clumping together. It also alters the taste. If you're getting iodized salt, it has iodide in it, which is a nutrient that is necessary for our lives, but most people get enough in their diet to help their thyroid. Most people don't need to use iodized salt. It's thyroid, right, babe? Thyroid, but they don't get enough. That's why they have iodized but, right, salt. But, but that's why they have the iodized salt. You should never cook with iodized salt because when the heat hits it, it alters the flavor and it tastes funky. So don't do that. Now, when it comes to kosher salt, there's two main brands out there. And there's a lot of debate on which one's better. One is Morton. The other one is Diamond. Morton is a little coarser. Diamond is a little finer. And it dissolves a little bit better. So it's great for baking. But both of them are perfectly suitable for our needs. So whichever one you've got, it's fine. The one I'm using right now happens to be neither. And it's a crystal flake version, which is fine. So the other salts that I have, I pointed them out to you the last time or time or two. They're all different flavors of salts, and they're all different textures of salts. So when you see fleur de sel, or you see Celtic gray, or you see French gray, or you see black Hawaiian, which is what this one is, the reason it looks different is because of the minerals that are found in the ground where the salt is found. That minerality is going to change the way the salt tastes. It's also going to change its properties. You do not cook with these salts. These are what's called finishing salts. So you want to sprinkle these across the top of maybe something with a cream sauce to make it look really cool. Um, the French gray and the Celtic gray are beautiful on fish because they have a lot of briny sea type of flavors to them. Um, I happen to love Maldon, which is what I talked about the last time. Maldon salt is pyramidical in shape. And I don't know if John can be able to get that in there. But it's, the crystals are shaped, they're large. And they're shaped like pyramids almost. And what they do is they add a crunch to the top of whatever it is that you're cooking. I'm gonna sprinkle some on our crepes later, on our um, savory crepes. And um, you can find it in regular and smoked. You know, smoked salt is great if you're doing, um, you, that is an exception I will let you cook with. If you're putting together a rub for pulled pork or a roast and you wanna get that smoky flavor, smoked salt's a great way to do it. Downside, 
it's kind of pricey. So, you know, weigh your options. Okay, so we're going to set this aside now just quickly. I'm going to try and get it in there without dumping it on the floor. You see how the juice is already starting to pool? We're just going to let these sit. Our filling, our topping uh, for our sweet crepes is done. Okay, so now we're going to move on to doing our um, savory. And this is where your skillet and all of your other tools are going to come into play. All right. The onion, the humble onion. Remember I told you, <coughs> hmm, this one's falling apart already. Okay, you wanna cut from top to bottom, leave your root end intact, because it helps hold the onion together while you're dicing it, okay? So, hold your knife, and we're gonna do an entire workshop on this. Do not hold your knife like this, if you, if you are watching a Food Network program and you see somebody holding a knife like this, that person's an idiot. Stop watching them. That's all I'm going to tell you. You want to hold your knife like this. It gives you more control and it gives you more precision. If you do this, your knife's going to be like that. If you hold your knife like this, like you know what you're doing, like you are in command, you're going to be so much better. All right. So, again... My hand is up and away. See how it's twisted up? And we're gonna go across. And we're gonna go across again. Now, I said a fine dice. That means I want as many layers as I can do and as many as you're comfortable is fine. And then we're gonna go top to bottom. And again, as, many, as close as you are comfortable. I'm pretty comfortable. And then crossways. So you're basically making three cuts on the onion before you end up with the product that you want. So you're going across this way, then you're going this way, and now we're gonna go this way. And what it's gonna do is combined with the onion, which is in itself layered like an ogre, um, it's going to help you get... Or parfait. Or a parfait. It's going to help you get... And I don't know if you can see this. It's going to help you get nice little dices like that. Now, if you make your, um, your cuts bigger, your dice is going to be bigger. And that's great for a different um, procedure. But for this, we wanted them kind of fine. This is roughly three tablespoons, quarter of a cup, and that's what we wanted. We're going to get that set up. And then we're going to take a couple of large cloves of garlic. I think I told you two, but if yours are small, use three. And again, flat part of the knife with the blade facing away from you. Come down on top of it and peel the garlic. Should have kept that trash bucket. Okay, and we're going to do it one more time. Blade away from you, and it's going to make the skin peel right off. Now, remember I said last week <clears throat> that the more you process garlic, the more garlicky flavor you're going to release from it. And we want we, this minced. We have a question from Vic. He okay, wants to know, does it make a difference using a wooden block versus a plastic block? Not really. Um, I... There's a lot of conversation about this. If you've got a really great plastic cutting board that is safe for your knife blade, it is not gonna dull it, go for it. Do not use glass, do not use marble. That's not what you want on your blade. It's gonna make your knife dull. This cutting board, John and I bought the week we got married because it was one of two things that I did not get in my bridal shower. So this cutting board is 33 years old. Um, I will cut onions and garlic on this and I'll knead bread on it to pick up the onion and garlic smell. But you'll notice I did have a plastic cover on here when I did the berries because this smells like onion and garlic and I don't want my fruit to smell like onion and garlic or taste like onion and garlic. So this one I specifically use just for vegetable and then I use the other one for fruit 
And when we get talking about cooking raw chicken, then we're gonna have a whole nother conversation, okay? But we wanted our garlic minced. So remember what I said to you, plant the tip of your knife, put your fingers, again, away from, you know, and just rock your blade up and down. Keep going over the same bit and you will end up with a nice mince. Now, I know my sister Nancy loves to use a garlic press. A lot of people do. Um, I am of the Anthony Bourdain um, school where I don't use it that often. I think it's kind of a unitasker. And he said that you should never use it. I do use it from time to time, but when I need this much, I'll just do it by hand. It's, it's just easier. Um, there's another great tool I have. I'll show you another time. It actually minces the garlic for you. Um, it's almost like a gigantic garlic press that you use on the cutting board. You rock it back and forth. But I wanted to give you some technique today. So, and this also takes me a little bit of time. So if you're using a garlic press, you're probably already done, which is awesome. Okay. Now I know that there's some people that are not cooking today, that they're just watching. And I wanted to let you know I've set up a YouTube channel. It's good for spooning. So rather than going through uh, everything on Facebook, you can just go to YouTube, good for spooning, and all of these videos are going to be there for you. So get your 10 inch skillet ready. We're going to start working on our savory filling. You want to heat that up to medium. So for those of you that are working on an electric stove, I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to catch up. And I'm gonna measure out the milk that we're gonna need. I'm gonna set this over here, because I'm done with that for now. Now, I, um, we're gonna add orange zest to our fruit filling. And Nicole messaged me and said, I'm allergic to oranges. You know, is it an absolute necessity? No. If you don't have an orange, it's fine. Use a lemon. If you're allergic to orange, use a lemon. It's fine. It's just to give it an extra layer and an extra step on that flavor ladder. So you've got something a little bit extra going on. If you don't have it, leave it out. This is quarantine kitchen. Work with what you got. It's fine. So when your pan is warm enough uh, to melt butter, you're gonna to wanna to put a tablespoon of butter in the pan, plus or minus. Doesn't have to be exact. I got it. Because I cut through the paper, I have a little bit of wrapper sitting there. Just plus or minus a tablespoon, it's fine. Get that melting. And you kind of want it to start, you know, bubbling and looking foamy. <clears throat> I'm going to rinse off my whisk because I may want to use it for this as well. While my butter is melting in my pan, sitting up. Okay, once your butter is melted, and mine still isn't, so once your butter's melted, we're going to add in our diced onion, and we're going to cook that just a little bit. Your sister Nancy is behind with the butter. Nancy's behind what? She needs a gas stove. She need, Well, it's impossible to have a gas stove in the state of Florida, apparently. There's a lot of places here in Las Vegas where it's impossible to have a gas stove as well. Um, when we were actually hunting for our home, that was one of the requirements, is that I had to have a gas stove. We had, um, my husband, if you don't know, is retired Air Force. We had moved all over the place, and I cursed every single time they put us somewhere with an electric stove. I really hate it. I don't feel like I have as much control. And so when we were hunting for our home, uh, for him to retire into, um, it needed to have a gas stove. And uh, it kind of... 
dictated where in the city we lived. We would love to live downtown, but there are no gas stoves downtown. Um, we would have liked to have lived in some other areas of the city, but there were no gas stoves available. So you're going to cook your onion until it's translucent. And again, with the salt. Remember what I said about adding the salt a little bit at a time because, ooh, how did that get in there? Um, it's probably from the container. Um, the salt is going to help suck out some of the moisture and it's going to give us a little bit better flavor and it's going to alter our texture of our onions a little bit so they're not so hard because we want them to be soft. They're going to be a component, not a star of the show. How's everybody doing? No comments, no questions. Well, there's comments uh, going on about knives and the, uh, uh, Stephanie Weiss was saying about uh, her Japanese knife. And oh, she yeah. Likes that. Absolutely. I mean, I have German, German, they call it German style. I have German style blades, which are what these Wustoff ones are, which are 30 years old. And um, my husband bought them for me at great expense for us at the time when we lived overseas. This one is a Shun, which is a Japanese style blade. The blade itself is a slightly different shape. Not the knife, but the blade, the point of the edge of the blade is a slightly different shape than the German. So you get a little bit different um, action on the blade. Vic, Vic wants to know if adding the salt to the onions sweetens them at all. You know, I don't think that it sweetens them. I think what it does is, it, like I said, it draws out the moisture and helps them soften. And, um, what? Wow. You keep kicking that. Oh I, oh, I keep kicking the mat. Sorry, you guys. The camera had the tripod is on the edge of the mat. Um, it helps to draw out the moisture so it softens them to make them a better component of the dish. But you're not gonna bite into a crispy piece of onion. Okay, once your onion is looking translucent and soft, and that takes like five minutes, depending on your oven, your uh, your um, the heat of your pan, then we're gonna add in our garlic. And you always wanna, if you're doing onion and garlic together, you always wanna start with the onion because it takes much longer to cook than the um, garlic does. And garlic cooks really fast and it's super easy to burn, so you gotta keep an eye on it. Now, I don't know about you, but your kitchen should be smelling amazing right now. And this is what our onion and our garlic are gonna look like. Okay? They're not getting brown, they're nice and translucent. Now we're going to add in our spinach. So for those of you who um, started with the frozen spinach, I, it should be squeezed dry. Um, yeah. Sometimes you got to be smarter than the container. Okay. Um, if you're starting with fresh spinach like I am, if I can get the damn thing open, um, the pan is going to help it wilt. Okay, so this has already been washed in this, you know, container, and you're going to add it a handful at a time and just kind of swirl it around to let the pan help it wilt. Because this looks like it's too much spinach for this pan, but once it starts to wilt, it won't be. If you've got the, your frozen spinach squeezed dry, you can add it at any time and just stir it on in. And you'll be ahead of me, because I have to wait for this to wilt. <clears throat> Nancy lost her feed. Oh no, Nancy lost her feed. So she'll, she'll catch up, because this is going to take a little bit. Vic wants to know if there's any benefit from cutting out the stem of the spinach. You know, when it's baby spinach like this, you don't really have to because it's super tender. If it's bigger spinach, like adult spinach, 
it tends to be a little tough. So unless you're gonna cook it for a long time, yeah, cut the stems off. But with baby spinach, it's so tender it doesn't matter. Okay, if you have a lid for this skillet, now would be the time to pop it on. What that's going to do is it's going to trap the moisture in there. It's going to help the spinach wilt, which will help us get on to the next portion of our cooking. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we're just going to wilt the spinach. This is going to form the basis of our Florentine. And I'm also going to pull out my Parmesan cheese while we're waiting. Lori was asking if it was okay to add more spin, um, add more butter. We're going to. We're going to add more butter. Because that's what's going to help us make our roux to make our sauce. So, well, yes, you could put more butter in. I think she was talking about in the pan. Yeah, you, yeah, you can put more butter in there if you want to. Um, you don't want to put too much because we're going to end up putting flour in here and we're going to make a sauce. So if you have too much oil, your sauce won't come together. It'll just be a greasy mess. So my spinach is wilting, you see? We want to get it all wilted down. And again, we're just cooking this on medium heat. We're not super high. I'm gonna give it another minute or two to allow our folks with the electric stoves to catch up. And we're gonna do, if you followed along with the croquemadam demo, I taught you how to make a bechamel, which means we make a little roux, we add a little milk, and we cook it down. We're not gonna get crazy this time and heat the milk and this and that, because this is just a quick sauce. So we're not, the sauce isn't the star of the show where, when it comes to this one. The spinach is, so we're really not worried about a lot of the other complications for making the coconut. Vic wants to know, is the garlic going to burn if it sits there too long? Yes. You should be stirring and hoping to get all of your spinach in contact with the pan to wilt down. See, look at how much mine has reduced. That's a 10 ounce package of fresh spinach. And look, it's like two and a half cups maybe. That's what happened. And you'll notice, I, you could still see my onions and my garlic. Okay, now to further assist this in the wilting process, guess what I'm gonna add? More salt. Now I've said before, I'm gonna say it again. If you knew how much salt a chef actually uses, you'd probably have a stroke. Because if you add salt throughout the cooking process a little bit at a time, you're gonna end up with food that is properly seasoned, well balanced, and it will not taste salty. If you add all of your salt at the end, you're gonna get a salt bar, okay? I, all together, between that and this, I've used less than a teaspoon, including the half a teaspoon I put in the grips. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna push our spinach to the outside, okay? You're gonna make a well in the middle of your pan, all right? We're gonna put in some more butter. We're gonna put the other two tablespoons of butter that I told you to have on hand, right into the middle. Let that melt. And here's where your whisk is gonna come in handy again, so I hope you rinsed it off. If you didn't, use a fork. We're gonna melt our butter. And we don't want the butter to brown. We want the butter to be nice and golden and starting to bubble a little bit. And then we're gonna add in two tablespoons of flour. Remember, equal parts, fat and flour to make a roux. Okay. Doesn't have to be exactly you know, just pretty close.
we're gonna mix our now don't worry if your spinach is getting into the flour it's fine it's fine because it's gonna all end up in there together anyway okay but we're gonna mix that all up and it's gonna be a little sticky and goopy don't panic look mine's a little sticky and goopy I'm sorry here is that better yeah, okay. Nancy's saying her butter is still melting. That's yes. fine. You're going to stir it around. I'm going to get that one piece of spinach. Just hang it. It will not come off. <laughs> All right. And gradually, once you get your roux going, this doesn't, you don't want it to be cooked. You don't want it to change color, you want it to stay blonde. You're gonna gradually, constantly stirring, add in your milk. How much milk was that? It was one cup of milk. And you wanna make sure you get into the corners of the pan to get any roux that's stuck up in there. just going to keep on mixing, making sure we're getting the lumps out, scraping up all the roux from the bottom of the pan. And you'll see the lumps. You will know the difference between those and your onions and your garlic. Trust me. Now you can use your wooden spoon at this point if you want to. You don't want to end up like this, getting your spinach stuck in your whisk. Um, and since mine's already done, I'm just going to keep doing it. And then once this is pretty well incorporated, Mont I will show you. Okay. Yeah, Monty wants to see it. Okay, I'm going to show you in just a sec. I want to make sure it's all well incorporated. If it looks too thick, just give yourself another dribble of, of milk. Okay, so see how this is moving easily that's what you want it to look like you want you don't see any great big lumps of roux which is perfect and now we're going to season it we're going to actually use some pepper you can use black or white um, or your tricolor just a couple of this probably wasn't on the list but i just figured everybody has pepper in the kitchen we are going to add the fresh nutmeg now remember if you can taste your nutmeg, you've put too much in. Turn your stove down once you get your soup, your sauce done. And again, fresh nutmeg, it looks like a pecan on the outside or a pecan for those of you in the south. And it looks a little bit like a brain on the inside. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, it's kind it's of too of close, purpose, sorry. Yeah. Okay, oop, shit. Just dropped it right on in. <laughs> And you just want a couple of, not too much, okay? Just two or three. If you're using um, already pre-ground nutmeg, you're just gonna put in a, a decent pinch, like less than an eighth of a teaspoon. And then we're gonna mix that into our sauce. Now you should always be tasting as you go. I'm going to just take my spoon and perfect. Now we're going to add our Parmesan cheese. And again, this is to taste more or less. Um, you'll notice I didn't add additional salt when I added the other seasonings because this is super salty. Now, once again, I always state freshly grated Parmesan cheese because the stuff in the green tube that you can find in the shelf stable aisle does not melt and it does not have the same flavor and cooking properties. 
and, it, and actually freshly grating it yourself ends up costing you less money. Now I think I need a smidge more milk because mine looks really thick. So I'm just going to add a little bit more milk. Maybe three or four tablespoons. Less than a quarter of a cup, maybe. I didn't even think you added that much. Hmm? I said it didn't even look like you added that much. Yeah, I did. Okay, one of our dogs is having puppy dreams. So, your sauce, your spinach should be suspended in your sauce. Your Parmesan should be completely melted through. You should still see little bits of onion and garlic. It's not supposed to be perfectly smooth. And look at that. Congratulations, you just made cream spinach. See? So now when you go into a fancy schmancy steakhouse restaurant and you get the cream spinach as the side, you know how to make it at home now. That's all there is to making cream spinach. Sometimes Parmesan's not in it, but it is in ours because that's how I wanted it. Okay. So, I'm going to push these to the side. Now, right before we serve, we're going to put our shrimp or our chicken, whatever you're doing, in there just to get them warmed through. So if you have a low um, burner like I do, you could put this onto the back burner. Remember I said put it off to the side so that it has the circular movement to keep it hot. I'm actually gonna put this one. You mean the pan off center to the burner? Yeah, what did I say? Off put to the, the side. Yeah, put it off center. I'm sorry, I wasn't being clear. Thanks, John. You wanna put your pan off center on the burner so that it's kind of heating one space and it will create a circular motion and keep your sauce fluid and keep your, um, and just stir it every now and then, just to, you know. But keep it on very, very low because you don't wanna scorch it. So for those of you with electric stoves, this is where yours is gonna come in handy because you can turn it way down and it will be a nice consistent heat the whole way. So I'm just gonna, this is for the flambe, so we're just, ignore this pan, it's just gonna cook. All right, so let's talk about making the crepes. Okay, I told you to have one of two things, either an eight inch pan or a 10 inch pan. So when you're measuring pans, it's not the cooking surface, it's the diameter from side to side at the top. So this is 10 inches, whoops, sorry. This is 10 inches from here to here, but our cooking surface is gonna be about eight, okay? This one is eight inches from side to side, and the cooking surface is about five and a half or six. You can use either one. Whatever you have is fine, but it has to be nonstick, period, end of conversation. If you are using the smaller pan, you are going to be working with, I hope you have this, if you don't, we'll work around it, but a large scoop that's three tablespoons, okay? And the way you know what size this is, that's why I put the number 20 on there. See the thing that's, that sweeps? It's called the sweeper. On the inside, there's a number. So if you're ever reading a recipe that says a number 30 scoop, a number 20 scoop, this is a number 20 scoop. Three tablespoons is a number 20. I'm gonna actually use the bigger pan, so I'm gonna use a quarter of a cup. Now, if you are working with um, the smaller pan and you don't have a scoop, you're gonna do a very, you know, you're gonna do less than a quarter of a cup measure because a quarter of a cup is four tablespoons. So just keep that in mind. You want about three tablespoons of batter going into your pan. All right. So we are going to put our pan on medium. We're going to wait for it to get warm. And you're going to get your spray ready. Now, 
safety first, people, okay? Do not spray this while it's on the flame. Your pan, your pot in the front is kind of blocking what you're doing. Oh, thanks, babe. Okay. Let's move it down. We'll be needing this for the flambe. I will put this back here on low. Thank you, honey. Okay, is that better? Cool. All right, I'm gonna move my strawberries over here. And while I wait for my pan to get hot, let's put our orange zest into our fruit. Okay, now, <clears throat> microplane again, best in the market. You can get them in a lot of varieties, but you will, it says microplane on the blade, okay? They are sharp, they are stainless, they are dishwasher safe, they are perfect. When you're zesting an orange, or a lemon, or a lime, or a tangerine, the part that you want is the colored part, okay? That is where all the oils and the flavor are. You'll notice you're not seeing any white. So you're not, you're just gently going across it and constantly turning your piece of fruit, okay? You'll notice I'm not getting anywhere near the white, okay? So in a, and you can, oh God, it smells so good. So in um, the citrus family, the zest of the skin has all this great oil in it. That's why when you roll a lemon back and forth, sometimes you'll see that there's like an oily residue on your hand. That's a lemon oil. And it's stuck inside the skin. So when you zest, you're actually releasing that oil and getting all that great flavor in your dish. You'll see, it should look like that. Can you see it? Okay. And then we're gonna, again, fold. Start away from you and pull it toward you. And you'll see, look at all that juice that I'm getting. And that's the, that is the salt and the sugar doing its job. And eventually, all of it will dissolve completely and you won't feel any grit or grain. Okay, so another word about maceration. You cannot do this really far in advance because then your berries turn into mush. You're gonna do it like we're doing it about 30 minutes before service. Okay. Here's where we're gonna to have to work fast because it demands it. <laughs> All right, where's my spray? Okay. You wanna remove your pan from the heat and give it a good spray, okay? Now when I was making these the other night to practice, John said to me, hey, are these like regular pancakes where you throw out the first one? And very well possibly. Right. Just giving my cream spinach a quick stir. So what you want to do, because these are going to cook very quickly, is have your Nutella or your Biscoff cookie cream. This one happens to be salted cocoa truffle spread. It's a wickedly prime thing from Amazon. So it's got a sweet and salty component to it. You want to have that open and ready to go, and you want to have your spreader ready to go, okay? Because we're going to spread these while they're so hot. All right, here goes nothing. <laughs> You're going to take your batter. Now, this is... How much batter are you using? I'm using the quarter cup because I'm using the larger skillet, and you're going to put it in and immediately start moving the pan so that you get a complete coating on the bottom, okay? This pan was a little hot, so I'm going to turn it down a little bit. This is, again, where you, you know, you got to kind of wing it to figure out exactly what's going on your stove. Now, when the edges, the very edges, start to look the color of an almond, like maybe 
the color a little bit lighter than the handle of my knife, the color of a whole almond with the skin on it, then you're going to use your spatula and it'll be firm enough that you will be able to scoop in there and flip the whole thing over at once. It should release very easily from the edge of the pan. And I'm not going to bother trying to put this up close to the camera for you to see because it's just a very, very, very thin line of that almond brown. And we're going to get underneath there and flip it. And that's what it's going to look like. Woo! <laughs> it's moving. Sorry. Okay. And you're going to put it back on there and you're going to let it cook because you want both sides golden brown. This is not an omelet situation where you don't want any color on your eggs at all. You want this to be gorgeous and golden brown. So these are going to be like a super eggy pancake. But it's... So those of you who um, don't know, I became a travel agent last year. After we went to Egypt, I realized that um, it was way too much fun and that I wanted to make a living in travel. So, you know, we did the croque madame a couple weeks ago, which is a French recipe. This is French. As a quick question, Joyce uh, Lacombe wants to know if you can substitute a little butter for the cooking spray. Yeah, but a very scant amount because your pan is already nonstick. If you put too much butter in, they're going to come out oily and we don't want that. That's why I recommended the cooking spray because you have a little bit more control. So I would say like a quarter of a teaspoon and make sure it's really well over there because we're not going to grease this pan again. We're just doing it the once. That's a great question, Joyce. Thanks. Um, just keep an eye on your edges and look at the bottom and see if it's cooked. Um, so John and I went on a cruise in January for my 55th birthday and we actually went to Marseille and never got off the boat for three reasons. One, the weather was miserable. Two, I was sick as a dog. And three, I had a cold, a really bad cold. And three, um, there was a transportation strike going on in France at the time. So there was nobody to take us from the port into the city. And it would have cost us like 70 euro in each direction to go by taxi. It was ridiculous. So while I've been to the port, I've actually never stepped foot in France. Okay, so if you've done this correctly, you should be able to slide that right out of the pan. <laughs> And okay. onto your counter. And onto your countertop. Okay, we want to work with this while it's still warm, but we want to get our next crepe going. So, repeat the process. As soon as that batter hits the pan, start swirling, and then let it do its job. Okay, so while this is hot, you're going to take your spread... Um, and be as generous as you want to be, but know you're going to fold it, okay? So I'm going to use about a tablespoon, and I'm going to spread it on half of my crepe, okay? Oh my gosh, that smells amazing! With the, the salted so caramelly chocolate. Can, mm -hmm. you, can you pick up the cooling rack? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bring it to you, Okay. So I'm just coating half of that crap because this is what we're going to do. We're going to fold it in half and then we're going to fold it again. So we're going to end up with these really pretty little triangles. And you want to work with it while it's warm so that your chocolate um, or your cookie um, sauce. sauce sinks into the crap. Okay, mine is just about ready to go again. And look, see how the second one's even prettier? Whoop. So this is, where the, it, this is where it takes time. You just gotta let it be. So while that's doing that, we're gonna give our spinach another stir. And if you wanna taste it, make sure that your salt level's good. Go right ahead, mine's fine. And mine is actually starting to cool off a little bit. So I'm just gonna turn the flame up just a hair because I want it to be hot when we're ready to 
drop our shrimps in. And it just, you know, this is one of those things, you know, Labette, my girlfriend Labette told me one of the great takeaways that she got is that you can't rush. You can't rush what's going on here. You've got to just let it do its thing. Okay? And you could keep checking it. Oh, mine's starting to look good. See? That's fine. We're going to move it over here. And we're going to repeat that same process. But I want to get my third prep started. Man, I haven't even cussed yet. Man, you should have seen me the other night. I was cursing like a sailor. <laughs> it was bad. Okay. So we're just going to spread. Again, be as generous as you want, but you don't want it to come squirting out of your crack. Can you hand me one of those plates? Right here. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to start getting this ready. And again, watch for the almond color around the edge. And you'll notice it'll start to fold in just a little bit. That should be when you flip it. Make them look. That's what you want it to look like. Okay. Now the first one wasn't as pretty like John said. You know, it's like pancakes. You throw out the first one. <laughs> oh, you know what, babe? I didn't think I pulled out a fork so we could try this. And we're just going to do three of these great big ones. If you've got the smaller pan, you're probably going to be wanting to look at four. Thanks, babe. And you'll see, when I get over there closer to the camera, you're going to see that um, the chocolate's kind of seeping through a little bit, um, through the little tiny pinholes. Totally fine. All right. So now we're going to, where are my flowers? So now we're just going to dress this plate. So we're going to take a nice scoop of these berries. And I'm zoomed in on your plate right now. So. And we're going to put it straight down the middle. You want to get some of the juice from the berries in there. Okay. And just because I have them. I'm going to put these gorgeous edible flowers from Desert Bloom onto my plate. Hey, baby, you should get your camera and take a picture of this for me. Because it's really beautiful. Okay, John's got it zoomed in. We're going to actually take a photo. Bring it a little bit this way. There we go. Okay. okay. So let's give it a shot, babe. Use the, you go ahead, use the one fork. Okay. Because we'll use the other one for okay. savory. I'm getting a little bit of, I might leave the blueberries for John because I know he likes them. And if you've got your whipped cream, pile it on. Oh my gosh, you guys. It is so good. Wow. I've never made these before. 
I practiced making the crepes themselves the other night, but I never did this. Oh my God, that is so good. Mm -mm -mm. Delicious. Oh my God. All right. So now that we're done in our house with the, with the chocolate, if you are only making the sweet version, keep on doing this procedure of making, making your crepe and fill them as you go along. For those of you that are going to be making the savory version with me, the procedure is the same for the crepe. Crepe, crepe, whatever. You know, it depends on how fancy you want to be. Um, I'm going to need this so I can plate our other ones. And then at the very end, I'm going to flambe that shit for you. <laughs> yeah, that ought to be good. Because I tried to do that the other night. Now, I have flambe things before. I flambe things live in front of an entire ship full of people when we cruised in Egypt last year. I could not get that damn thing to flame up the other night. Okay, so now the plating on this one is going to be a little bit different. Instead of it being folded into quarters, we're actually going to roll them like, um, like an enchilada or a cannoli, you know, or something like that. Because it's going to be a nice folded up, uh, rolled version. So... What you want to do is this is where the parchment paper comes in if you don't have a great big cooling rack like me. So the thing about doing this is you can leave them, but don't stack them on top of one another. You kind of want to shingle them, okay? Swirling, swirling, swirling. Now, the reason for that is so that you get a nice even coating across the bottom of the pan. If you just dump it in, it's going to start to cook and it's going to stay there. But if you're swirling, you're going to coat the whole bottom of the pan. You're going to get a nice, um, consistent thickness on your crepe. We're running long today, you guys. I'm sorry. And again, it's going to start to dry and curl in at the top. It's going to be a nice almond brown. And it helps if you have your pan on the center of the burner. I didn't just now, so um, it was a little challenging. My spinach is starting to bubble a little bit. That means it's hot. Great. I love cream spinach. You know, I'm I'm not a big fan of going to a steakhouse, really. That's just not my thing. But I can make a complete meal out of the sides. I love the Brussels sprouts. I love the cream spinach. I love all that stuff. And we've got a decent steakhouse nearby. Yeah, we've got several decent steakhouses nearby. Well, in the city, yeah. yes, but I mean, even near the house. You know, it, what's really funny is everybody here in Vegas thinks that, oh, the station casinos, they're just for locals, whatever. There is a great little steakhouse right in our local uh, station Casino, called the Charcoal Room. And I gotta tell you, it's pretty decent. I mean, we've had some really decent steaks in there. Always cooked properly, the staff is really good, and they make a really decent martini too. Okay, so now that we've got- And a Manhattan. And a good Manhattan. 
So now that we've got our third crepe going, we're gonna put our fish or our um, chicken into, into the um, cream spinach just to take the chill off it, okay? Because it's gonna get wrapped up in those hot crepes. Excuse me. Sorry about that. And again, the, 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 you can't rush it. You gotta let it do its thing. So that they are all beautiful golden brown. Now what I've got going on in this back burner is the sauce for our crepe Suzette. And we wanna get that down to be a nice um, syrup. So I have, it, the crepe Suzette is traditionally orange. But I happen to have blood oranges, so I used that instead of regular orange. And we're going to use that zest from that orange over there to finish the dish. Now you can make your crepe batter the night before, let it sit in the refrigerator covered, and use it to make brunch. Um, you can also make your crepes ahead of time and put them in the freezer between layers of um, parchment and they'll keep for a month or you could do it a couple of days in advance. Okay, so we've got our... Hold on a second. I did something stupid. I flipped the... You flipped the camera so people were looking yeah, at you? Yeah, and I don't know how to flip oh, it back. okay. Hang on. You're getting to see my really good looking husband. That's it. There you go. Right. Sorry guys. <laughs> it's my fat fingers. Okay, so what we're doing in this case is not completely in the center, slightly off center. We are laying out some cream spinach and in this case, three shrimp because these shrimp were 21 to 25. So when you're looking at a bag of shrimp, frozen shrimp in the store, or you're looking at the uh, fish counter and it says 21 to 25 or 26 to 30, that's how many shrimp per pound, okay? If you see U10, that means there's less than 10 of them per pound. And so those are gonna be some big honkers. So you're just going to very gently roll it and you're going to move it seam side down on the plate, just like that. Okay. Nothing to it. Nothing to it. Again, slightly off center so that you've got enough um, to roll. You know what I mean? You want to make sure you can roll it properly and put as much filling in there as you're comfortable with. And they're not as fragile as they look, so don't panic. Are you going to save one for the Suzette, or are you going to do no, no, one over? No, no, I'm going to make some more while everybody else is cooking their, um, finishing up their crepes. Okay, so. Now, you can um, garnish this however you like. You could put uh, fresh parsley on it, um, which I actually have, but did not take out. Um, you could do a little line of um, cream spinach across the top if you want. You can
Then I say when you go to school, when you go to culinary school, you shouldn't put a garnish on the plate unless it's edible or if unless it's part of the dish. But just because I have these and they're so beautiful, I'm using them. Okay, so let's get that fold underneath. There we go. All right, so there's our Florentine. Beautiful, easy, easy, easy. Okay, you want to take another picture of these, babe? Let me put a, I'm going to put a line of this cream spinach just across the center because I've got it. We've got a little bit extra and it'll make it look pretty for the picture. And again, don't rush, take your time so it looks gorgeous. Okay. So let's give it a shot, see what it tastes like. Now your chicken, you could have, if you shredded it, you could have mixed it right into the spinach. Vic mm. wants to know, do you need to add anything else to, to this for the flavor ladder, like lime? Mm -mm. Okay. No, because remember you did your garlic and your onion, your butter, you added your salt, your pepper, your nutmeg, and your Parmesan cheese. So you've got a lot going on in there, and you don't want to overpower the taste of the spinach or the shrimp, because they're both kind of complementary, but you don't want them to get overshadowed by anything else. Mmm, you guys, that is so good. My husband loves spinach. It's like his favorite vegetable. All right. So, while everybody else is working on assembling their either sweet or savory preps, I am going to step out of frame and get another whisk. Oh, yeah. This is good. Okay. All right, I have a nice syrup working. I'm going to reheat my pan. Yeah, the pan wasn't hot enough. I should have left it on. That's okay. Okay. So in order to make crepe Suzette, traditional presentation, is four of them in a circle. So we're gonna fold them with no filling at all, just like we folded the chocolate ones, okay? So if you are eating, please you know, let us know. How do they taste? How did yours come out? Did you have any questions or problems or concerns or challenges? Um, what do you think, babe? How have they come out? Really? <laughs> we probably should have started with the savory ones first, the dessert second, but you know, like a lot of people say, life short, eat dessert first. <laughs> and I know some people were, um, they're sweet breakfast food people. I am not. I, my husband is a pancake waffle guy. So this is right up his alley. You know what else you could have done with this? For the kids, it'd be great. You could do sliced banana and Nutella or sliced banana and that cookie, uh, Biscoff cookie cream. You know, any fruit that you like works really well. I chose not to use banana because the strawberries are so beautiful and because I like, I like to eat a banana by itself. I don't like it in stuff. Does that make sense? I know I'm a little high maintenance. <laughs> Monty and Mabette did the savory one only and Great. they like it. How to come out? Be sure to share your pictures. When I get the photos up, be sure to share your pictures online because I'd love to see how you guys are doing it. Apparently, Jim and Donna uh, are enjoying theirs as oh, well. Oh, good, good. I'm really excited when I hear that you're actually cooking with me. You know, Nancy said she wanted me to make things that I had never made before. And I, honest to God, other than testing the recipe to make sure it was duplicatable, I had never made a crepe before in my life. 
This is the second time I'm making them. Okay? Um, they're not hard. You know, it's, it's, you can do this. This is really easy stuff. Lynn wants to know what's in the pan that you're going to set on fire. Oh, that, well, I started talking about that and got sidetracked. So, um, this is a syrup of blood orange juice, um, butter, and sugar. And traditionally, crap, Suzette is made with regular orange, but I had the blood oranges and didn't want them to go to waste, so I juiced them to use it. And you can see, it's kind of like a super, um, like almost jello-like consistency. And we're gonna end up adding Grand Marnier to this. And I think I'm gonna put another tablespoon of butter just because I can, because uh, it looks a little thick to me. Now this recipe that I'm using um, is from New York Times. You can find it online. There's a gazillion um, crepes Suzette recipes out there. Just find one that you like. All right. we, we subscribe to the Times because yes. we pay for good journalism. That's right. Okay, and again, we're going to fold in quarters. Let me get this one started. Now I'm going to use this pan because I know it is flame safe. It is uh, by a company called Made In. This one is a blue steel pan and when you get it, it looks beautiful and this is one of those things like the uglier it gets, the better it is. And that's how this one is. So we're going to lay our crepes into the pan. See, we're going to make it look like a pie. Okay. And you can actually do this with uh, pre-made ones. Like if you, um, like I said, you made them um, the night before and put them in the refrigerator. Let me show you how to store that. So, Ziploc bag, and then you just put parchment between them. Can you guys see that? So that they don't stick together. Okay, I have three here that were left over from my recipe trial the other night. Okay? But since I've got batter left, I'm going to make these ones for the Crepe Suzette Fresh. And so you can see because my pan wasn't the proper temperature, how this one is not as pretty looking as some of the other ones, that's okay. It's cooked. It's just not as pretty because the pan wasn't the proper temperature. So one of the, um, the things that I love best about travel is eating all the food. So when we, I started talking to you guys about this before, when we went to um, Marseille, we never got a boat, and I never got to eat any real French food. <laughs> so we are planning, once this is all over, I am putting together a tour group to go on a river cruise through France. So if you'd like to go with me, let me know, and I will send you the information as soon as I get the uh, things in the works. <coughs> And it's probably going to be 2021, um, the summer maybe of 2021. You know, we're talking about a year from now. We're not talking about, you know, six months from now. Ooh, this one looks beautiful. And again, like Lebec said, the big takeaway is don't rush. Let it do its thing. So um, next week, next Saturday, happens to be my husband's birthday. So instead of Nancy getting to choose the recipe, Senor Nota Bartolo is getting to choose the recipe. So as soon as he decides what he wants to make, I will create a shopping and equipment list for you. And it will be a quarantine kitchen recipe. My husband knows that that's what's got to be done. Um, but he is going to choose the recipe for next week. So a couple of the other things that I have coming up that I know I have coming up for you 
is somebody in Florida, and um, chime in if you're watching because I can't remember who asked me, said that they wanted to do a dish called Chicken Aristocrat, which I had never heard of, so I had to look it up. And we could totally do that recipe. Um, I talked it over with Nancy. Um, it's It sounds delicious. I've never made it before, so it'll be a um, definitely a challenge. Um, ooh, that was perfect. Um, it'll be a challenge because I never made it before and we'll all screw it up together. Um, I am actually going to be sharing with you very soon um, Grandma Nettie's world famous chicken salad. Center your pan. Thank you. Uh, the world famous chicken salad recipe that everybody asks me for. Um, the way I'm going to do that though is we're gonna do it as a knife skills class. And then um, I will print the recipe after. Because if I give you the ingredient list, you're not gonna need to watch me. You're gonna go, oh, that's what's in it? I don't need to watch her, I can do this myself. So we're gonna do a knife skills class in conjunction with the chicken salad. Um, I still want to do the chicken pot pie with the garlic cheddar biscuit on top. Um, I'm thinking about an instant pot recipe for some pulled pork. So um, I'll be working on that too in the next uh, few weeks, um, doing some recipe trials to make sure that it is something that's doable for most people. Okay, so our crepes are ready. They're in the pan. We're going to take our syrup and we're going to pour it on top of our crepes. And now we're going to return this to the pan. And here's where the fun comes in. <laughs> Notice the flame is off. This is Flambe Safety 101. Um, off flame, add your booze to the pan. Now we still have a little bit of um, our glaze still in there, so we're gonna stir that up. We're gonna put our flame on low. Now, if you're really good, and I'm not, you can just like Tilt your pan over and set your liquor, liquor on fire. I'm not that good. So I have this. <laughs> okay, so. Can you guys see it? I'm zoomed in on it. And you're just gonna swirl it around. And you just wanna let it keep on cooking so that all of the liquor. The alcohol, yeah. Yeah, all of the al alcohol in our uh, Grand Marnier cooks away. So even if you were a non drinker, like my dad was, this is something that is totally safe for you to have because you're burning away all the alcohol. Okay? Now we're going to take and plate it. And you'll smell it. You'll smell it burning off. And mine looks darker than a traditional um, crepe Suzette because like I told you, I used um, blood oranges because I had them. on the plate. No cookie for me. And we're just gonna let's just clean that up. <laughs> so I look like I went to culinary school. And look at how pretty those are. Oh, hang on. Oh, sorry. I'm in the wrong place. 
Man, the wrong place. Now you'll see the dark brown edges there. That's where the alcohol soaked into the crepe and kind of scorched the edge. So you're gonna have that nice caramelly um, flavor. And we're just gonna do a little bit of fresh orange zest just to brighten it up. I'm okay. focused in on the plate right now. And let's give it a quick taste. Oh my God, you guys. I don't think all my alcohol burned off because I can still taste it, <laughs> but it's delicious. So I'm gonna pass that to the husbando and let him try it. All right, so now you got it. You got three different ways we did it. The crepe dough batter is super simple. Make it the night before. And you could do like a fancy girl's lunch and whip up crepes and be like, oh, you know, chi-chi and shit. Or you can do a great family uh, brunch by letting the kids chime in and help cut the strawberries and smear some Nutella. You can even do peanut butter and banana if you want and sprinkle some chopped bacon across the top. The thing about the crepes is they are so neutral that you can literally fill them with any damn thing that you want, okay? So I hope you do this again. Um, the video is gonna of course be up here on Facebook. I'm gonna also download it and share it on YouTube so you can see all the videos all in one place. Um, please let me know what your questions are. Uh, there weren't a whole hell of a lot of questions this time, which is kind of interesting. Either I'm doing a really good job of explaining things or you're not really paying attention and you're just like watching. Or like, they're so lost they have no idea what to ask. Yeah, or you're so lost, you don't know what you're doing. So uh, I really look forward to hearing your feedback. I really look forward to hearing suggestions on what you would like to see me cook. Next week, my husband is going to be picking the recipe and Nancy's just going to have to deal with it. Um, because it's his birthday and we can't go out to eat, so you're going to make him something special that he wants to eat. Um, thanks again for joining me on Good for Spooning and Quarantine Kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, wash your damn hands. <laughs>